based on the data that are available now, and remember those are still pretty limited, it's not clear that people with well-managed type 1 diabetes are at any greater risk of COVID than the general population. So as public health officials start to lift the social restrictions, those instructions can apply just as much to people with type 1 as to the general population. And that's a good thing, because we're still quite a ways away from a vaccine. Those of you waiting for a cure for type 1 know that the course of research is seldom straight and the timelines aren't predictable. A vaccine will need to be developed, tested in animals, then tested in a large number of humans to ensure that it's effective and safe, then production rolled up, licensing and distribution. It's going to be next year, almost certainly, before we have a vaccine. The question also talked about getting back to normal. And I think there are some ways in which we hope we don't go back to normal. I hope our improved hand washing routines continue. That will protect us not only from future waves of COVID, but from a host of other illnesses. I hope that we've learned that when we're sick with a respiratory illness, we stay home, that being a hero is protecting your coworkers, not going in when you're sick and sharing your virus with others. But I also hope that some of the changes in the healthcare system persist. Many people with type 1 diabetes are really benefiting from virtual care, being able to get that five minutes of advice over the telephone instead of having to take time off work, travel, and uh, attend an in-person visit. I hope those models of care continue and are improved as we go forward. And I think that uh, COVID-19 has raised a better light on the importance of public health and the importance of coordinated use of data. That public health approach is critical also for managing the diabetes epidemic. And we've been calling for an approach that uses is data-driven and evidence-based and coordinated in our Diabetes 360 strategy. I hope that coming out of the COVID-19 crisis, the value of public health is seen more clearly and data are used to manage not only acute infectious disease epidemics, but chronic disease epidemics. Finally, for those with type 2, those who are older and have other conditions like obesity and high blood pressure, your risk may be higher than the general population. And so depending on the exposures in your community and your personal risk profile, you may need to work with your healthcare provider to determine a plan that best protects you going forward as we continue to evolve through this epidemic. Insulin resistance is a key concept that has helped us understand how type 2 diabetes develops. Insulin resistance is the key component of the metabolic syndrome and understanding the metabolic syndrome has helped us understand how cardiovascular disease, abnormal blood pressure, abnormal blood lipids are all linked with type 2 diabetes uh, and even some cancers. Understanding insulin resistance has helped us understand that fatty liver is an important uh, feature associated with type 2 diabetes that can cause liver cirrhosis and even liver cancer. Ultimately, we want to help reduce insulin resistance so that we can reduce cardiovascular disease, diabetes and cancers. We now understand that healthy diet and physical activity are very effective ways to prevent or reverse insulin resistance. Measuring insulin resistance properly and accurately in humans is really quite hard. To do it optimally, a person would need to visit a lab and sit for eight hours with multiple uh, intravenous lines and infusions running, which isn't really practical for day-to-day -day life. Some of the common blood tests that we can use to guess or estimate insulin resistance are actually quite tricky to do. Not every lab can measure some of the components easily, and the equipment required to measure some tests like insulin levels might only be available in larger hospitals. As a result, it's not surprising that testing for insulin resistance can end up being quite expensive. It might be reasonable to justify the expense if the tests were accurate and precise. 
Unfortunately, it's actually quite hard to accurately and precisely measure insulin resistance in an individual using these uh, easier or quicker tests. What we find is that levels vary from day to day. If people have exercised recently, if they're sick, these are all things which can affect uh, the measurement of the test. And so the precision of the test and the accuracy is not as reliable as we'd like it to be. Furthermore, the result you get today will be different from the result you might get in a month. As a result, we generally don't recommend blood testing routinely. Another challenge is that insulin resistance is not a single value. It represents a spectrum and there's no real agreed cutoff that says that somebody does or does not have insulin resistance. We can actually make a much better assessment of cardiovascular risk, risk for diabetes, and the presence of metabolic syndrome using some quite simple surveys. For example, the CAN risk score, which is available at the link, which we'll put at the end, is a very good tool to assess risk for diabetes. It incorporates important components like family history, which is a major driver of type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance. We can also use uh, measurements of waist circumference and blood pressure to help us understand uh, whether somebody has metabolic syndrome. And again, I'd recommend uh, visiting the website uh, at the end of the uh, segment that describes uh, features of the metabolic syndrome and uh, how you can address those. Metabolic syndrome is generally the result of genetic predisposition, which becomes unmasked as we get older, as we gain weight, as we become less physically active, and particularly if we eat an unhealthy diet. So the good news is that by addressing exercise, physical fitness, healthy diet, we can reduce our risk for metabolic syndrome we can reduce our risk for diabetes. So let's get moving and make for a healthier me, a healthier you and a healthier Canada. Hello everyone. As of right now, April 29th, we have no data that differentiates between type one and type two diabetes amongst people who have contracted COVID-19. All that we do know is that people who live with diabetes are not at increased risk of getting COVID-19 infection. However, if you have diabetes and you get COVID-19, the severity of the disease may be greater. Fairly recently, there was a publication that actually looked at glucose levels in people who were admitted to hospital in the United States with COVID-19. And what they found was that interestingly, those who were found to have very high blood sugars in hospital who were not previously known to have diabetes seemed to do worse than those who came into hospital with known diabetes. It is difficult to know what to make of that information given that the numbers were still fairly small. However, I think what we can say is that glucose control in hospital does remain important as it always has for other infections and I would also argue that glucose control outside of hospital also remains important, as we know from other infections such as influenza or pneumonia. So I think as someone living with diabetes, the most important thing to do is to remember what you can control versus what you cannot control. And what you can control are your blood sugars, your surroundings, and protecting yourself. But what you cannot control is what's happening out there in the world. So therefore, we do not know the difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes in terms of COVID-19 complications. However, I think we know that those living with diabetes should continue to work on maintaining their blood sugars and, of course, important things like sick day management rules.